Okay, everyone, welcome to week five of Introduction to Antenna Basics. Uh, this will be an introduction to microwave antenna design. Uh, thank you everyone for coming back if you've been attending the class. And I know some people had some issues and they're not with Hackaday, but with their own notifications. And this might be the first class that they're attending. So welcome. So some quick housekeeping like we normally do at the beginning of class. There will be a final quiz for a certificate. If anyone is interested in doing it, I made up the quiz in the past couple of days and it covers um, the full length of the course. I think there are three questions that we'll go over tonight. And I tried to make it, there's no math, um, there's no intention of having gotcha questions or making anything unnecessarily difficult. It is intended to cover some very core concepts and some of the questions that are over, particularly some of the topics that we'll even cover today are things that I've been asked in uh, interviews for antenna design engineer positions, right? Uh, very, you know, first level interview questions, basic core concepts that those kind of people would like you to know to prove that you know something, anything about antennas, right? Um, and to be clear, I didn't always do well on some of those questions. So you can learn from my mistakes there. Uh, second point, the nano VNA. I know we had some questions about how to actually take measurements with the nano VNA that we've talked about, like S11, return loss. And in the midst of typing up notes myself, I found a much better document that I've linked to and also posted on the course discussion page, um, particularly because they really go into the variety of options that you can do with the nano VNA. Um, that might be helpful. And one thing that I realized as I was starting to type up a document about making measurements and that someone, um, I think Tom commented on social media today is the problem of holding an antenna while conducting measurements that you might not realize until you actually go to do it yourself. So I have the nano VNA hooked up to uh, a computer and I have a cable to convert uh, the SMA to this little whip antenna that goes to just a really cheap Balfang uh, UV5R uh, transceiver that I have very common for amateur radio. Um, and so this is on SWR and you might see a couple of peaks there. And one thing that you might be able to see is it changing when I move my hand, right? And so one thing that you don't wanna do that I wanna caution people if you haven't made these kind of measurements before. Um, first of all, you want to try to tell at where the base of your antenna is gonna be for your um, reference plane, but you also wanna be careful of what's around your antenna. We covered that during the testing course, but that also means you, right? Um, you can affect your antenna if you are holding if anything conductive is touching it or near it, um, including yourself. Um, so some people have suggested, you know, putting it on a wooden table or even making a 3D printed stand to hold it nicely. Um, but one thing you don't want to be doing is touching the antenna um, and then a part where you shouldn't be touching it, right? You, you want to get as accurate a measurement as possible. And a last point that I wanted to mention that might not fit within this class, but it occurred to me today, some people, because of this course, might be thinking of getting an amateur radio license, which is great. They have a very you know, active community if you're interested in that. And I also really recommend getting a license to students as a way of kind of being able to show on your resume even that you have passed some basic level of RF knowledge, right? 
but particularly considering that it's Pride Month here in the United States, two points should be mentioned if you're considering getting your amateur radio license. One, that licenses are able to be publicly looked up by anyone with your call sign, which means that they can see, first of all, your name, and second of all, your address that you give. Some people get around the address part by getting a PO box or a linking it to their business address instead of their home if you don't want your home address publicly available. And another point of that is if your legal name does not match how you want to be called, that is what gets sent to the FCC as publicly available. If it is ever changed while you have an amateur radio license, any previous name given is available for public searching to anyone that wants to look up your call sign. So if you are a person where that is important to you, that's something to consider before applying for your license. Um, I know they didn't do a very good job of explaining some of those things to me before I got mine. So I did want to just urge caution if that's something to consider before you get your license. But again, a great way to show that you have some knowledge, be able to legally radiate and transmit, especially if you're wanting to play around with testing antennas or your own transmitters. And again, a very active community of very, very knowledgeable people. So with that, I'll recap from the last class where we talked about planar antennas. We talked about slots, which are complements to half-wave dipoles, not the folded dipoles that we discussed in the one class, but just the regular half-wave dipoles. The length of a slot determines the resonant frequency. The width of a slot determines the bandwidth, right? Those are your two main considerations for what you're going for in that kind of design. Patch antennas are known for having a directional pattern. Gain, lower-ish, usually less than 8 dBi, and they are linearly polarized along the width of the patch, although you can make them circular, and we discuss various methods for doing that. And when we talk about microstrips, the wider the microstrip, the lower the characteristic impedance, or Z0, as we call it. Getting into the things for this class, I have a little bit of a shorter slide deck but the 3D printed horns conversation usually interests people a lot and they ask a lot of questions. So I wanted to leave room for that. But we'll be going over waveguides, horns, some 3D printing with horns kind of work that I did in undergrad, and then a quick cap over parabolic reflectors. So first of all, waveguide. And why do we need waveguide? Well, we're talking about microwave frequencies in this class, right? And so at higher frequencies, coax, you start to get a lot of loss, right? And what does high frequency mean in this context, right? Because there's the HF designation of high frequency. We mean uh, it probably starts becoming a trade around X band, you know, um, in that eight to 12 gigahertz range, any higher than X-band and particularly after 18 gigahertz, you're going to want to look at using waveguide for your design. And you'll know that because most coax is only rated to 18 gigahertz. And if you want to go above that, it's going to get very expensive and you are going to have significant amounts of loss. Um, one thing that I will mention, because we're going to talk about the waveguide cutoff frequency, is that you can put higher frequencies through a lower frequency rated coax. You, it's not just going to drop to nothing, right? The signal will still get through. You'll just have a sizable amount of loss. So if you're not doing it professionally and you can take the loss, you know, that's your own decision, but higher frequencies are why we use waveguide. And typically they're rectangular. They can also be circular. I haven't personally worked with circular waveguide and 
what I'll be covering in the next few slides is for rectangular waveguide. And you can see the photo on the right is a depiction of rectangular waveguide and how we note the dimensions for that. And the A dimension is always the width or that kind of largest uh, dimension of the waveguide and B is the height or the shorter dimension. You know, I'm calling it width and height, but if you just turn it over, that's hard to tell, right? But it's the longer dimension and the shorter dimension. And it's almost always depicted the way that it is the diagram on the right in any kind of text or diagrams, but that's common. And you can see here that this horn that I have has a waveguide interface, right? So A dimension and then B dimension. So in the United States, we use uh, what's called the EAI, um, EIA size. You'll see, I have a link in the back of the slides to very common kinds of waveguide, right? And there are some European standards as well, but obviously being an American, I'm familiar with the American standard. So one example is WR28 waveguide for the deep space network, deep space KA band frequency. And WR is, stands for rectangular waveguide. And one thing I wanna note because some hobbyists like to uh, listen to spacecraft as you know a hobby. And what I've mentioned here about the DSN deep space KA band. So NASA's deep space network has prescribed bands that they use for space communication. And they are separated by zones. You have your near space zone that uses certain frequencies, and then you have your deep space zone. And off the top of my head, I can't remember if it's 1.5 million kilometers. I think that's the difference between them or 2 million kilometers. I should know that. But if you are looking to listen in to any kind of spacecraft like probes that would be using the DSN for that, that's where you would start. Um, and all of that is publicly available information. The Deep Space Network has a telecommunications link module. I think it's the 810-005 that has pages and pages and pages and pages of information. That's actually really, really interesting if you're interested in learning anything about space communication or how the DSN works or what the block diagram to their giant antennas are. Um, I didn't include a link to it, but I will post it in the class because I find it interesting if you're the kind of person that wants to read deep space telecommunication uh, link design workbooks in your free time. So an important note is if you are testing waveguide components on a VNA, the procedure that I discussed previously for an SMA cal or calibration is not applicable, right? You need to do a waveguide calibration for it to be accurate. And the differences between a waveguide cal and an SMA cal, there's sort of two primary ones, right? Part of the problem with doing an open measurement on a waveguide is that an open waveguide is actually an antenna, right? It just, the signal would radiate out. And so you have, I think it's two additional me measurements that you'll do in a cal kit of doing, for example, a short and an offset short, you know, by a quarter wave. And it depends on what frequency that you're doing. So there are literally additional measurements. So it takes more time. And then the other thing that can be quite a pain and takes up a lot of time is when you do a waveguide cal and you have pieces to the waveguide, do you see these four holes here? You have to screw in your, um, why can I not think of the word, uh, bolts. Um, 
into your flanges for the cow kit components for when you're doing your measurements. So four per um, standard, right? So that takes time, it's annoying. If you become a professional RF or antenna design engineer and you want to prove yourself invaluable to senior members of your team, learn how to do a waveguide cal, any cal on a VNA and do it correctly and offer to do it for them. They will love you for that because it's time consuming and very detailed work that principal engineers don't always feel like doing, right? So I think I said last class, I wasn't gonna go over modes, but I am gonna go over modes just because I, I do think it's important at a very high level. This is something that you would cover in like a fields two class in electrical engineering undergrad. And they would go over it much more extensively of how a wave behaves through waveguide due to boundary conditions more so than I'm going to do, right? But I'm gonna give very, very high level, just so when you see these terms, when you see these acronyms, you might be able to think, oh, I saw that, that's kind of what this means, I think. So modes occur because of the boundary conditions that are imposed on the wave by the waveguide, right? You have this conductive structure, structure that's guiding the wave. And there are three-ish main modes that you'll commonly see with rectangular waveguide, right? This is all specific to rectangular waveguide. You'll see transverse electromagnetic or TEM modes. And that's when neither the electric or the magnetic field um, are in the direction of propagation. And remember, direction of propagation, we're going through the waveguide this way. Transverse electric, I'll show a picture of what this looks like later when we get to the horn section, but there's no electric field in the um, direction of propagation and transverse magnetic is describing where the magnetic field is in the direction of propagation. And remember from the very first class, we talked about how waves behave and that we have this orthogonal relationship, right? Where you have your E field, your uh, magnetic field, and then your direction of propagation as they like go forth, right? So very, very high level, just wanted to mention what these terms mean, what they're talking about, and they're talking about the behavior of either the electric or magnetic or both fields and how they relate to the direction of propagation through that waveguide. And now I'm gonna talk about the, one of the primary things, really the most important thing when you're looking at waveguide is the cutoff frequency. And so the cutoff frequency of a waveguide is the lowest frequency for which a mode will propagate in it. And unfortunately I had a very interesting choice of professor for my fields two class. And he taught this to us incorrectly and we had to figure it out for ourselves. Um, but it is the lowest frequency for which a mode will propagate. Anything below that will severely attenuate and not pass through the waveguide. And there are some equations if you are really interested in calculating this for Example, if I wanted to pass L band signals through a V band waveguide. So L is very, is much lower in frequency, right? Like one to two gigahertz versus V band waveguide, very, very high. It's very small, kind of almost looks like rectangular straws. And the L band signal might attenuate within a millimeter or two of entering the waveguide because it simply is not sustainable for that size of wavelength, right? And this is another reason why waveguide is for higher frequencies, like true high frequencies in the microwave region because waveguides for lower frequencies would have to be gigantic, right, for that mode to pass through. 
So how you calculate the cutoff frequency, if you're interested from the measurements, is just the speed of light divided by two times, remember that width, that largest internal dimension of the waveguide. Um, this calculation specifies that it's in meters. I know the speed of light in meters per second off the top of my head, as I'm sure most RF and antenna engineers do. Um, you can put it in feet or other uh, links. You just have to convert so that they can cancel out. But that's where you get your cutoff frequency. And that's how you determine what size waveguide is appropriate for what you're doing. There is some overlap in waveguides available. Um, for example, like KA band is a wider range and there are several sizes of waveguide that will support KA band, right? Um, so some of that also becomes related to price or what will fit or mass, things like that kind of consideration. But the most important thing is your cutoff frequency. And I've listed the calculation here. If you don't know what kind of waveguide you have lying around the house or in some kind of uh, ham garage sale, then you might have to measure it and calculate it yourself. But otherwise, this information is publicly available for standard rectangular waveguide, right? But this is how they arrive at that calculation. And that larger internal dimension, the A, the width, is what's important for it. So we talked about waveguide, and now I'm going to lead into horns. And I keep showing this um, horn antenna here as partly my example for waveguide because it has a waveguide interface. As most horns do, you can connect coax, uh, usually like through an adapter, um, but all the horns I'm really familiar with use waveguide, right? Because it tends to be for those higher frequencies. And two of the most important things to know with a horn antenna, and this is something that I was misinformed about when I first started working with them, is I somehow thought that the flare of this opening was what set the frequency, because that looks, it looks like the antenna part, right? That's, that's the important part, that's what must do that. But if you've learned anything from me talking for the last however many minutes about waveguides and cutoff frequencies, it should be intuitive or at least understandable after some thought. The waveguide part is what sets the frequency in a horn antenna with a waveguide interface, right? The waveguide dimensions are what set the frequency. The flare, this aperture flare here, affects the gain and the directivity or the beam width of the signal, how, how narrow or broad your radiation pattern is, right? So, and I have in here, and I'll talk about in pictures later. This is a standard gain horn for X-band, uh, 15 dBi. And you might see very like tiny horns that can fit in the palm of your hand. Well, more than this one, technically this one can. But KA-band horns might be really tiny. Um, if you're doing testing, and particularly if you ever get to see an EMI, electromagnetic interference, or EMC electromagnetic compatibility uh, testing area. They will be, their lab is like a giant Faraday cage and they will have gigantic horns. Like one person can't lift them that are that large that they are shooting RF at components and stuff, right? So there's a wide variety that you can play with. Again, usually, usually increases with the frequency. And I talked about a standard gain horn. They're used commonly in testing when you're taking gain measurements so that you have something to go off of. And you can also use them with research, but there's all kinds. I'll talk about that here in a second. I just wanted to discuss the graphic on the right covers the waveguide portion of the horn. And then there's the flared horn here. 
and the signal, if you're transmitting, goes out this way, uh, receiving comes in this way, right? So what kind of horns are there? there there's so many, there's so many. This isn't, this doesn't even remotely cover them all. But I definitely wanted to mention the pyramidal horn, which is what I have here. If you look closely, it might be hard to tell on video, um, but every dimension is flared from the base, right? It's flared this way and it flares out this way. And so this is a pure metal, it's the most widely used. And you can see the difference in the E plane or the H plane horns, which I think I have seen maybe one of each in my very short lifetime, maybe not that short of a lifetime, um, but they're available as well. And they're so named for the orientation of the longest dimension there, whether it's in the H plane, you know, they're orthogonal to the vertical propagation of the E field through it, or, you know, if the horn is vertical with the E field going through it. There's also a conical horn and an exponential horn, which I had not even heard of until I started making slides for this class. And there are also many more varieties, including um, you might have some that have these exponential, what am I trying to say, curves built into them. You might have some that have corrugated, like ridges uh, throughout them. And there are also, you can add dielectric lenses. All that stuff is pretty advanced and almost more researchy or R&D research and development uh, kind of level things. Um, but if you are, if you've already tried working with a few horns and you want to level up with something much more difficult, there are a wide variety of options that you can play around with. And so now everyone please be kind because I'm going to talk about some very terrible research that I did when I was an undergrad, but um, people seem to like hearing about it, not just because they're getting to hear uh, stories of things I did, right? And so I proposed a project when I was a senior in undergrad because I wanted to go to a conference for free. And so I decided to come up with a research project about how would you 3D print an antenna in space, such as on the International Space Station, like the ISS. If you don't have a big fancy metal 3D printer, which I've only seen very large industrial versions of, they take up lots of space, they're very heavy and they're very expensive, but I knew that the ISS has regular you know, almost hobbyist level 3D printers up there. So thought, well, if something broke while you're on orbit, how could you use a hobbyist 3D printer, just standard, something that anyone might have or at a makerspace, and how could you make it radiate or receive waves? So this is the antenna pictured here on the left, covered in silver, is what I have in my hand. Right, it's an X-band, again, 15 dBi standard gain horn, very standard dimensions. And here on the left, I have the antenna coated on the inside in aluminum tape. And on the right, the copper colored photo is the same antenna covered in copper tape. And I wanted to see how poorly these worked, right, instead of focusing research on really pushing boundaries of the greatest thing we could do. I wanted to see what is the bare minimum you could do to survive, to communicate if you had to with this work. So I got the idea from Antenna Test Lab, which if you have social media, um, they sometimes post really fun game contests. They have, uh, they're actually a lab that test antennas, as you might guess from the title, and they offer their services, but they also have 
some very interesting blogs and uh, kind of outreach that they do. So if you are interested, I would definitely recommend checking them out. And so they did this, they 3D printed antennas um, and wrote a whole blog about how you could do it with free STL files that I have included a link to here at the back of the slides. But the thing that I didn't like for my research as an undergrad is that they use this dichloromethane, which is so poisonous that they took it out of paint stripper because it was so toxic. And given my knowledge of how safety conscious NASA is for human spaceflight, I thought, well, you really wouldn't want to be doing, be using something so toxic they took it out of being stripper, but uh, they probably wouldn't let you anyway, even if you wanted to. So what could I do? And um, you've already guessed it, I used tape. But the 3D model that I used is shown here. This is in Google SketchUp. Um, but as I stated, standard gain horn, 15 dBi. I used the basic standard PLA filament. Nothing wild, nothing advanced. I know they make uh, conductive filament. I wasn't able to get any for comparison in time before the project ended. I used a lower infill percentage because I was having to pay for these prints and I was a broke college student and just use a very standard uh, diamond fill pattern for when I was printing it. And I also ran a simulation of what this was supposed to look like in HFSS. Right, which is that very expensive antenna modeling and design software that we talked about uh, towards the beginning of the course. And so here you can see that T mode coming out, how the wave comes out of the horn on the left-hand side. Um, that's the 3D model showing the E-field magnitude. And I think I mentioned previously, if you can even look at videos of simulations, this really helped me understand how waves move through the horn, how they move through waveguide, right? I'm a very visual person and seeing it like this was much more helpful than just seeing, you know, curves drawn through a square in a diagram in a textbook. So if it helps you, I would certainly recommend uh, looking through those um, if you can. And on the right, you'll see a return loss plot and this was an X-band horn, so H12 gigahertz. And you can see, um, you know, it's all resonant at this frequency in the simulation. So, but it's got that two hump kind of curve that's gonna be important for later. And that's what I want you to remember is actually just the kind of general shape of the return loss plot here in this idealized simulation for the same dimensions that I was going to 3D print. So these are the actual measurements. And if you are experienced, you can tell right away that some of them are terrible. But what we have here in the smooth red line is the aluminum tape. And you can see that kind of two hump return loss curve that we saw on the previous slide, right? The dotted black line is the copper tape. And you can see it doesn't quite perform as well with that return loss. There is more of the signal getting scattered around with that copper tape, which was really interesting. And then you'll see the PLA, which is in the dashed blue line. And one thing I want to call your attention to here, because you might see that peak between nine to 9.5 gigs and if you're not used to seeing some of the behavior that's on the right of that uh, dip, that reson resonance point, you might think, oh, that's really great. It's resonant at that frequency. But remember, this is PLA. You have to have it be um, conductive. And whenever you see the behavior on this right side of the plot in the dash blue line, this wavy back and forth, that is usually a bad sign of an impedance match, right? Unless you're going wild with some new kind of antenna that I haven't seen, 
almost always that is an impedance problem when you're seeing that behavior in your plots. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind that you can see in real life here. But again, the main takeaways that I want you to see from this plot are that there's that kind of two hump behavior that is similar to what we saw for the simulation and that the copper tape is not that great compared to the aluminum here. And since copper is, oh, I don't remember, I think order of magnitude more uh, conductive than aluminum, um, off the top of my head, I can't quite remember, but I, I thought copper would be much, much better, right? I thought the aluminum would be horrible. So that was surprising. And we'll talk about why we think that is. And next I have S21 measurements, right? So when, remember when we talked about S21, we've got two antennas that are the same and they are at least the far field away from each other. And we take, after you've done a two port cal on your VNA, um, you aim them at each other and you see how much is lost. And generally speaking, you shouldn't have any metal or reflective surfaces around when you're doing this kind of measurement if possible. Uh, for the dimension, and someone pointed out uh, that this far field calculation is basic and introductory and that they have done advancements and more research as to a more specific way to calculate the far field, which is true, right? It's been published. But because this is an introduction to the basics course, I wanted to use the simpler equation, not only because it is more basic, but because that's how I was taught for the very beginning, right? Um, you really don't learn about anything more advanced until you're in those ad advanced and very focused classes. So for this class, we're going to just use uh, this equation for calculating the far field. The D dimension, that's gonna be um, you know, your largest dimension across the face of your horn. And so now let's talk about the plot, what's going on here. So remember we're, you know, shooting a signal into one horn, capturing it in a second horn at port two, and we're seeing how much we lose. Um, so we want this measurement to be high on the visually on the graph speaking. We, we don't want a lot of loss which is opposite for a return loss where we wanted that very, very low, right? And you can see here, the solid red line for the aluminum tape is outperforming um, at least a little bit the dashed black line of the copper tape. And here you can really see that the dashed blue line of the PLA, it's all over the place, right? And so what this means is more signal power is getting to your port two or your receive antenna from the antenna with aluminum tape than from the copper tape. And you can see in some places it almost overlaps, right? It's not that big a deal. And other places, the difference is much larger, right? And let's see, oh, let's go back to the photo. And some of you who are experienced or remember when I was talking about microwave scattering and the roughness of gold when we get into microwave antennas, you might have already figured out what's probably going on here, right? If you can see on the left, look at how smooth that aluminum tape is, right? So the aluminum tape was much easier to manipulate and it was wider and thinner. So we were able to have less overlap. You can see on the right, there's a lot more copper tape being used. There's a lot of overlap. And so those edges are creating diffraction and scattering. And anytime you have diffraction and scattering, that means your wave is not going to where you want it to go to, right? It's being scattered all over the place. Remember, we talked about scattering parameters, seeing how much of the wave is scattered away. So the important takeaway from this is looking at 
material roughness and trying to keep things as smooth as possible, even if you have to use a less ideal metal to do this. And again, I want to be clear, this is not the way that Intended Test Lab did it. They use a uh, metallic conductive paint. And all you have to do is, is cover the interior surface and you want to overlap a little bit because of fringing effects. Um, but you can see from the color, you know, the outside of your antenna is fine. You're looking at that interior, the place that guides the wave. You want, because of those boundary condi conditions, you want that to be conductive. Now, some people have been very enthusiastic with suggesting things that I did not think of when I did this research. And new suggestions, um, particularly for other people wanting to try the project are always welcome. Uh, sometimes they're asked a little aggressively, like why didn't you use conductive boat epoxy when you did this? I am I'm, I'm not a person who is sitting on a lot of conductive boat epoxy knowledge just based off how I've lived my life, unfortunately. Um, but there are absolutely other ways that you could do this project on your own and could probably have much better uh, response than I did, right? So you could use conductive PLA filament on a 3D printer. You could do the sanding and conductive paint that Intended Test Lab did. I will warn you, when you go into uh, read the blog, they do talk about how difficult it was to get the uh, PLA sanded, uh, especially for those higher frequencies, because again, we talk about even the diffraction from these little tape edges, right? And PLA is a little rough when you print it. So that's going to be something to take into consideration. And they didn't have a great time sanding the PLA. And so that wasn't one of their favorite parts. Um, please use caution if you're going to be using anything severely toxic um, to smooth PLA or paint. Um, but yeah, there are a variety of methods that you could use to metalize it. But again, you just have to get it metallic and smooth on the inside portion and kind of wrapping around there. So by all means, if you have a suggestion or if you've done this and found a better method, feel free to comment, um, particularly even on the course page. But this was a fun project to do to kind of get a better knowledge for me personally of horns. It was fun to get to 3D print something for the first time for me. And it's also just kind of neat to have 3D printed antennas flying around. Uh, other people think it's cool, particularly if you do outreach with children. You don't have to worry about them breaking anything terribly expensive, right? And they're so light. Um, you can just toss them around. So it can be it can be a fun tool to use for outreach in that kind of way too, if you have any interest at all. But again, highly recommend looking at what I did and improving upon it for yourself if you're interested. So lastly, I'm going to talk about parabolic reflectors. So these are, commonly used for space communication, right? Either uh, space to ground or ground stations here on Earth to communicate to space. If you work with spacecraft, these are typically your high gain antennas, uh, commonly abbreviated HGAs. Uh, sometimes if you have a spacecraft that's near Earth, you might have a horn as your high gain antenna between like maybe 50, 15 to 20-ish. DBI of gain. I already mentioned the NASA Deep Space Network. Uh, there are other networks that have these. Um, NASA has Deep Space. They also have the Space Network uh, ground stations. One point of note that I want to cover is that I, I personally have not uh, simulated a parabolic reflector because of the difficulty and uh, the drain that you have in that mesh, right? Um, so it's recommended to use a physical optics or PO solver uh, 
A common one is picra grass. I think they might have um, a trial that you can use. I have not used it. I am just pointing out that if you want to simulate it, these can be more difficult, right? Um, and if you're an amateur radio, you might simply repurpose a you know dish satellite communication antenna. Um, other people in the amateur radio community do EME or Earth Moon Earth or Moon Bounce communications, and you have to use very large uh, parabolic reflectors to do that, right? To bounce the signal that far. Uh, yeah. Excuse me. One point that I will make is that parabolic reflectors, uh, because they start getting very large, right? It, it becomes more than just an RF problem, which professionally, when you design antennas, all your antennas are more than just an RF problem. You have teams of a variety of different disciplines of engineers working on one antenna design, um, mechanical, uh, materials, thermal. But particularly when you get to the size, you, you're going to have to start considering things other than just how the wave behaves, right? Uh, for example, if you're going to put a one meter uh, HGA on a spacecraft, do you need a gimbal to move it around? Does it have to be out on a boom? Is it going to be flying near the sun so that you need a special thermal coating on it? Does it have to fly around Jupiter and you know get a lot of radiation and have a lot of surface charging concerns and stuff like that? So just know that there, the level of difficulty goes up, right? And it's not all about RF. So why are parabolic reflectors used? Uh, because of the gain, right? You get huge, huge amounts of gain from these antennas. And the equation uh, that looks very simple um, is determined by the diameter of your reflector and your antenna efficiency. And all antennas have an efficiency, but you really see it come to play and list it out on data sheets when you are working with these parabolic reflectors, right? It can be anything from on the lower end. Um, if it's not that efficient, maybe 0 0.3, 0 0.5 to, you know, um, 0.8 or, or higher. You can't have a perfectly efficient antenna. Um, but as far as the gain goes, so some of examples that I've seen, so the Cassini mission had a four meter uh, high gain antenna on it. And they actually did something really interesting where it was multi-band. They had, I think, X, S, X is an X, uh, X-ray, sorry, I can't talk, S is in Sierra, and then like KA band. Um, because they use it for a variety of modes, transmission modes, right? Science downlink, telemetry tracking, control, uplink and downlink. Um, but it had over 56 dBi of gain. I like the Cassini mission just because it is the largest HGA that I personally have heard of. Um, I've never worked with a four meter HGA myself. I think the largest that I've dealt with so far on any space mission is 1.2 meters, which is still sizable, right? Um, and uh, HGAs in particular either um, because of international contributions or because it's intended design are almost always given in meters and not like feet, right? Even if you're an American working for an American company, we always refer to them uh, in meters. And then the deep space network that I mentioned before, they have, I think it's 34 meter um, antennas and 70 meters, which are their largest antennas that they have. And they're around 67 uh, dBIC. dBIC is decibels relative to an isotropic circularly polarized radiator. You see it very frequently in uh, parabolic reflector antennas, sometimes even in horns if you have circular polarization. Oh, 
I did a terrible thing and didn't talk about polarization for the horn. Um, I'm gonna go back. Um, polarization is linear normally for a horn. You can circularly polarize it um, either by adding in two different ports and phasing them, having a phase offset, or uh, you might see an attachment called a polarizer that they uh, stick on to the base of the horn. But naturally a horn antenna has higher gain directional pattern. Um, it can have side lobes and some back lobes too, but linear polarization. And then uh, parabolic reflectors, because I have only worked with them for space communication, I have only seen um, you know, circular polarization, frequently the gain is given in DBIC. Um, and one of the ways that you'll see sometimes horns and reflectors together is the horn can be used as a feed for the reflector. And so there are different types of feeds depending on how you want to do it. Um, axial feed is the most common that I personally am familiar with. So you've got your big primary reflector, might have some supports, and then you have your feed antenna right there smack in the middle, right? Uh, you can also have it like off axis or offset fed, like shown on the right. And the Cassegrain or Gregorian antennas, I personally think I've only seen those on like radio telescopes. Um, I think Gregorian is what the Allen Telescope Array has at the Hat Creek Observatory in California. Um, but remember when we talked about a physical optic solver, this is when you get into optics and ray tracing and not just RF as to the behavior of the waves, right? Um, which is why they were used for things like telescopes and also as antennas, it's that blend, right, for that very, very high frequency um, that uh, you have to use. So somehow I talked for almost 55 minutes. So this is the last class. So I'm gonna do a, a recap of the important things that you should probably know from this class here instead of the next class because there's not a next class. So the cutoff frequency is the lowest frequency for which a mode will propagate in a waveguide, right? That's the important thing uh, that sets the dimension of your waveguide that you're using. And the commonly denoted as A or the width or the largest internal dimension of a rectangular waveguide is what sets the cutoff frequency. And please note, it is the internal dimension, um, not like that exterior of the flange or anything like that. It's that internal dimension. And in a waveguide horn antenna that I have here, your waveguide part is what sets your frequency and your aperture flare is what sets your gain. Um, and also like your beam width, but primarily um, the bigger the flare, the bigger the gain, right? That's how that works. So here are some resources that I've kind of talked about and have linked in. Uh, one is a listing of waveguide size, sizes. If you're ever looking for, and I use this professionally all the time, remembering, especially across different programs, um, that I might be working remembering like which uh, size waveguide goes to which frequency I might be working with um, and what those dimensions are, looking up what the cutoff frequency is. Some information about the microwave horn antenna that can be useful and even talks about them using being used as a feed to a parabolic reflector a link to the antenna test lab blog about 3D printing your own antennas. They have um, the SDL files linked. You can literally just download them and plug them in to print. Um, they also have, I think it's Google SketchUp uh, files for modeling 
if you want to play with that. How I looked through um, that textbook of how a pyramidal horn is calculated. It, it's a lot of advanced math. So if you are wanting to design one of your own from scratch, I've linked to a calculator that's a bit easier to handle um, rather than pages and pages of equations. To be clear, if you're taking an intended design course in undergrad or grad school um, from an actual teacher and not me, they will teach you the pages and pages of equations. Um, that I have never used as an actual engineer. Um, so yeah, the parabolic reflector, I talked about the gain being a product of the diameter of the reflector and the efficiency. If you don't feel like doing that calculation by hand, there's, there's always a calculator out there for you. And if you're interested in reading more about the Cassini mission with their giant HGA and how they um, used multiple bands for a single HGA when they were way out there, um, Cassini was Saturn, right? Yeah, because it dipped through the rings, which is significantly um, far away, right? Several AU or what is that AU stand for? astronomical distance, one AU is the distance between Earth and the sun. So that's a handful of AU out there. Um, but anyway, great thing about NASA and JPL is they publish a lot of stuff that they do. I did not link the DSN uh, link design handbook, um, but I will post that in class just in case anyone is interested. It goes very deep into detail of what the DSN is like. I have always personally liked the DSN. It was always a dream to work with it myself. Um, but it also talks about things like how to calculate hot body noise from spacecraft going around different planetary bodies, including the sun, um, atmospheric effects. If you're looking to talk to one of the amateur radio satellites, even um, how to include the right atmospheric loss calculations for whatever your uh, elevation angle is, um, the DSN link budget design book has, has a module for that. So with that, I'm still gonna take questions, but I did officially want to say thank you for um, both to Hackaday for letting me teach the course and suggesting and coming up to me for doing that. Christina and Sophie were really excellent to work with. And I wanted to thank the class for almost always being very respectful, asking great questions and tuning in. And I hope that you have learned at least something about intendants that might be useful to you either as a hobbyist or, you know, ideally this course was centered for a first year RF engineer, what you might learn on the job kind of stuff. So I, I tried to hit that uh, demographic. Um, and a second note is if you thought I did a terrible job and you can do better, or if you thought I did an okay job, but I just didn't go into detail of something that you are an expert in, by all means, please, uh, feel free to submit a proposal to be an instructor for Hackaday U yourself. I know we have a lot of knowledge in the community. There are people attending the class that are experts, um, far, uh, far more senior experts in certain topics than I could ever be. Um, but that's how you do it. That's the link. But thank you for everything. That's all I have for the class and for the course, um, please continue to comment on the course page or ask questions if you have anything. Um, and y'all are great. That's all I have.